Our guest today is Hotep Jesus. Very excited to be bringing him on today, especially after studying him on Twitter and seeing what he's doing with social media, with his business, and hearing him on the Joe Rogan experience lately. So CJ, can you bring our guest up on screen here, please? Ladies and gentlemen, Hotep Jesus. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us on Juneteenth of all days. Ha, ah, yeah. What's up, bro? Thank you for having me. Hey, so I I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. And I, I, you know, I, I want to really honor your wisdom. And I want to make our, our interview here about trying to answer the bigger picture questions. Okay. You know, I, as, as a black American who is very confident in challenging mainstream narratives about black history, black culture, black America today, dude, we're going to get to your, that last segment you did on Rogan about the, the re revisionist history on slavery. Yeah. That's some heavy stuff that everybody needs to know. I want to, I want to hit on a couple things, get those out of the way and then get to some bigger quick question picture or bigger picture questions. Uh, but first please, you know, I heard you say the story, but not a real explanation. What does it mean to refer to yourself as Hotep Jesus? Ha, well, um, uh, right around the time that Mike Brown was murdered and Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and all those guys, uh, Sandra Bland, um, the uh, Black Lives Matter was born amidst all of that chaos. And, uh, you know, my heart went out to the greater black community, to those families that lost their sons and daughters. And uh, I started to provide solutions. And when I provided those solutions, um, the black community didn't like them so much, at least the black liberal community didn't like them so much. So uh, they uh, hurled invective comments at me. I was lambasted for um, centering black economics. Uh, you know, they thought that, you know, um, I wanted to just replace white patriarchy. So they called me Hotep and I'm like, you can't be Hotep. You know, Hotep means peace, satisfaction, or be at rest and many other meanings. Uh, so you can't be a Hotep. So they kept calling me a Hotep. So I said, fine, I'm a Hotep. And uh, the voice that I was tweeting in um, was very holy, I guess you can say. So then somebody was like, what do you think you are? Some sort of Hotep Jesus? So I was like, oh, I kind of like the ring to that. So then I was just like, I took it on and that's just been me ever since. That's a great stage name. Your Thank real you. name is Brian Sharp, and that's Sharp with an E, right? And your website is BrianSharp.com. If anybody wants to go check that out. .co. .co. Oh, .co. .co. BrianSharpE.co. So, yeah. um, Hotep, <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, from this segment that you did with, with Joe Rogan, there was a really, well, hold on. You know, I'm sorry. I want to go back for a second. You said the liberal black community didn't like your solutions. What were the solutions and why? Did it have to do with the Democrats and dependence on government as a whole? Yeah. So at that time, I didn't know the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. I was very ignorant to the U.S. political system, you know, my well, entire do life. You know, do you know that there is a, a precise difference between the Democrats and Republicans? It's It's like going off a cliff at 70 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour that's the difference i mean i yeah yeah you're, sorry it's, you're making a more nuanced point i know i couldn't i couldn't hesitate i couldn't couldn't <laughs> hold back at my my joke in sorry yeah yeah no nah, you know um there really is no difference like you've just illustrated right um but you know back then i didn't know the nuances of what each policy was pushed and you know who was what and so on and so forth and frankly i didn't care um you know, I was a avid Alex Jones listener, so I always saw things um, through uh, Alex Jones or Farrakhan lens. Right. So mm. I saw both parties as always being evil. I saw white people as being evil. I saw the government as being inherently evil. So I didn't care about any of that stuff. I just knew there was good and there was evil. Um, so, yeah, so uh, my solutions were black economics. You know, if you look at uh, Dr. Claude Anderson uh, and his book, uh, Poweronomics, um, you know, that was something that I'm more aligned with was, you know, let's let's worry about, you know, how we circulate the dollar in the black community, how we provide jobs for each other and, and how we grow uh, our own technology. And um, 
you know, the 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 Marxists um, were able to get to the black mind, uh, and the Marxists um, push uh, socialist ideology to these black liberals. Mm -hmm. So when you come with more of a, you know, capitalistic or free market point of view, they say, you know, you just want to replace white supremacy with black male patriarchy supremacy or some, whatever they're teaching those people. And mm -hmm. I was just like, huh, what? <laughs> no, you know? So, uh, yeah. So that's what I was, uh, you know, highly criticized by, um, the, uh, black feminists and the black Marxists, to be more specific. Now, I'm going to connect this to the slavery narrative revisionism because it's very important, as you described, in the development of the paradigm of black America today, the mentality, the way that mental suppression happens in a unique way as it does to everybody all over the world, but it is a unique story and phenomena among black Americans and how the history is used to psychologically, emotionally manipulate and suppress people. But I, I feel a little bit remiss already having done my audience a disservice, not mentioning sooner the ways in which you have escaped that. And as an entrepreneur, you're also involved in Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency as well. So before we get to the big picture stuff, uh, how how is that? What what credentials do you want to lay out as an entrepreneur, and, and how does that relate to, to what we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, my credentials are deep, man. You know, we're going back to, I want to say, I started my first business in 1996. The age of 16, I had a printing business, and um, I used to print business cards and flyers, um, and I used to do other things. You know, hustle. Like before that, you know. Um, um, we uh after gym class everybody was like smelly right and sweaty and whatnot so i used to uh i had a lot of different types of cologne i would get every year for christmas so i would line them up in my locker and i would charge people to use my <laughs> cologne all right um, high school bathroom attendant <laughs> yeah 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 so you, 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 know? you really had a bright future as a bathroom attendant ahead of you <laughs> yeah you know i um i actually had three lockers you were assigned one i had three <laughs> lockers you were franchising <laughs> yeah so i had the one that was assigned to me was like in the old building and i didn't use that so much i just used it if i had classes in the old building and then there was um the main hallway where everybody hung out so um i actually was able to obtain that locker um from a graduate and then i had uh, another locker in the new building that i got from another graduate so i was collecting lockers as people would graduate right so, you know, nice. if I had a class in a new building, my mm -hmm. books were in a new building. If I had a class in the old building, those books were in the old building. And then all my hustling happened in the main hallway. So what city is this? Uh, I don't want to say. <laughs> it's where you grew up? Yeah, this is where I grew up. This is high school. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations on selling cologne in high school has, has passed for you. Yeah, no, I just, it's other reasons. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> I'm just curious. You mind, say, I mean, if you say no, I can't even say the reason, of course, but can you say what the reason is? I just, just personal reasons. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I have a certain amount of success, and I don't want that town, that racist town, to get any credit for my success because they deserve it. Ah, yeah. yeah. Even yeah, if yeah. it's only part of it, that's a great reason by itself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I used to hang up uh, in the locker. I used to hang up um, pictures of um, Tyra Banks. I used to rip out of the uh, Victor uh, Victoria's Secret magazine. I used to hang them up. So people used to come out by my locker and see the latest edition of what I hung up. So, um, you know, I was providing entertainment as well as a cologne. So I was always like a, just a natural hustler. And then my father worked for, um, he worked at the Prudential Building in Newark. And, um, uh, when um, the attorneys used to throw away computers, um, he would bring them home. I'd fix them and then we'd sell them. So, um, you know, I was involved in tech since, you know, the Commodore 64. My brother is a graduate of NJIT and a math genius. And today he's uh, still, um, I believe, VP of IT at some big bank. Um, so I grew up around technology. My father um, you know, when GPS first hit, my dad would put the GPS custom into the Honda Accord that year. Um, and, you know, we always had uh, we used to go to the computer shows and we used to build our computer from scratch. And when CD burners first came out, we had CD burners. When the Internet first hit, we were the first people to have Internet. 
Um, okay, Grandpa. <laughs> What's yeah, CD? exactly, exactly. You know, um, so you know, I was always been around technology. My dad's a tech geek. You know, whatever new technology comes out, he's gonna get it. Um, when the first plasma screen came out, he had it. When the first LCD screen came out, he had it. Um, you know, even to the day, he's got state of the art equipment in his movie theater. So, you know, I, um, you know, I wanted this. I don't know if anybody knows anything about sound, but my dad has a pair of glass speakers and they're made by Martin Logan. And these things are thousands and thousands of dollars. But the sound quality, like people have never even heard of Martin Logan. But if you're into sound and tech for home, then you would know Martin Logan or Nakamichi. Right. Right. But it, this ain't like Sony type stuff. We're talking about right, high right. end. So I've always been surrounded by somebody who is just involved in tech, which is why I'm still involved in tech. So then as I get older, um, you know, when I go through my uh, record label phase and my uh, mortgage broker phase, and then I'm working as regional marketing director for an energy drink company, uh, which has an investment from Curtis 50 Cent Jackson, um, I'm involved in uh, CPG goods. Um, consumer packaged goods. And then I move on and I launch a company for uh, Carmelo Anthony. And then I'm talking to like investors and people that are starting up companies. And basically at the time I was doing like marketing, um, experiential marketing, film marketing and social media marketing. And I'm telling all these people I'm talking to like, yo, you guys, why aren't you in the mobile app space? Like getting a mobile app space. It's, it's, it's like early and it's like time, you know, time to get in cause it's going to grow. And if you look at the app store now, how much millions of money is, is hundreds of millions to generate it through the app store, you would see what I'm talking about. Exactly. It's Making probably in the billions. dumb freemium games <laughs> that trick people into giving up 50 cents at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when I saw people didn't have that vision to go into the mobile app space, I just, I launched, I, I, I thrusted myself into that space. So I went to go um, work for this company. Um, what was it called? I forget what it was, but it was a messaging, a text messaging app company. And the CEO and founder at the time was a guy named Maher. And when I walk, I was used to walking in interviews and just getting jobs because I interview really well and I just know what the fuck I'm talking about. So I was used to getting the job and I didn't get this job. And I was like, why didn't I get this job? And um, so can I, I just- Hold on, I, can, I, can I ask you, sorry, it's a little sidebar. You know, yeah. as long as racial issues aren't everyone's mind right now, you're a tall, handsome black dude. Uh, you know, you carry yourself with a, a powerful presence. So I imagine if you're applying for a job, that that, that plays in your favor. But you also have dreads and, and, and facial hair and a distinctly black appearance. Yeah. Do those play yeah. against each other somehow? Uh, not until you got hired. <laughs> well, so you yeah. hide it for the interview, shave and, and tuck all the dreads up? Nah, well, I just like my dread, my dreads are pretty new. Like that kind of, that came okay. in like 2012, right? So before then, I had a short haircut. So, so this is your I, entrepreneur look. You used to have a more clean cut, work yeah. for the man kind of, you know, yeah, eager, eager black employee look. Exactly, okay. exactly, okay. yeah. So um, so not yeah, to so, condemn either strategy for any individual. Right, right. Um, yeah. So you know, uh, I, I I got into uh, so I had that interview and I didn't get. I didn't get the jobs. I was like trying to wonder why. And I realized because I wasn't up to date on what was happening with the app store and with digital marketing. So I put myself, you know, in, in virtual schools and I just studied for like a year straight and I just got better at it. And um, because he was asking me certain questions and as he asked me questions I didn't answer to, I kind of like made like a mental note and I went home and just looked everything up and then I just started learning app marketing. So then, um, you know, fast forward, I've worked for over 20 apps. I've worked for uh, two app marketing agencies and I just became really smart in it because I had experience in it, you know? Um, and then that's kind of like how I, I, I segued into um, the, the app space. So then um, I'm on LinkedIn. This was two years ago, I'm on LinkedIn and um, I see the same guy Maher. And this time he's got a Bitcoin company. So I hit him up. Now remember, I didn't get hired when, <laughs> last time. So I hit him up. I'm like, yo, what's up with this? Da, 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 da. And at first he was just like, ah, you know, didn't pay me much mind. And then I didn't hit him up, but I think they had like a little bit of trouble gaining traction. So they're like, all right, let me hit this guy up because I know this guy has a huge following and, you know, he's got some experience. So we sat down and fast forward. I'm now a co-founder in that company. So it kind of nice. shows you how you can go yeah. from like the same dude who told me I wasn't qualified for this job. I'm now yeah. like, 
like that's my homie now like it's my brother yeah. like you know um, if, I, if i may if i may just sidebar on that for a second for the benefit of uh our very libertarian audience yeah uh you know and, and i think this applies to you too any kind of revolutionary solutionary type activist who is distinctly out of the norm but especially libertarians i don't know if you noticed you know we're a white male intj dominated movement and the other thing that kind of unifies or, or the other big demographic trend among libertarians is that we're victims of the system some way yeah you know the captains of the football teams and the high school cheerleading squads aren't the first to challenge the establishment right yeah and so we have a lot we have a lot of punks and misfits and outcasts and round pegs trying to fit into square holes and a lot of us have uh you know issues with rejection mm. and i just want to underscore this is a powerful part of hotep's story to say that you know you can have complete rejection we're not hiring you come across the same guy circumstances change it wasn't about you it yeah. wasn't about you. It's usually not about you, you know, yeah. and, and this is something that I, I just want to always make an important part of the message of my show is, you know, have a healthy ego uh, in, in a positive sense. Have a healthy sense of yourself. Be confident in your own self-worth. And yeah. if if, uh, if if Hotep hadn't at least maintained his general framing and persistence, he wouldn't be where he is with this one little obvious example. Oh, yeah. Even in situations where I know I wasn't in the wrong, I still blame on myself. I'm like, well, I could have done this. I could have done that. And yeah. I could have done this and I could have done that because, uh, you know, I feel like everything in your life is a result of something you did. You put yourself in every situation that you're in. So if you don't have an attitude of every single every single detail of your life is not your fault, then you have no power. And so even when somebody does me wrong, I'm like. That was my fault. I could have handled that situation differently. And I look at it as a learning experience. So the next time I come across that person, they try to do that same wrong thing to me. I have the power to defeat them. So is there anything else you want to get out of the way before we get to the big history revision question here? No, nah, let's get to it. All right. So I'm going to try to sum this up because I, I want to paint the I want to make sure that I understand it from what you were saying. And obviously, Victor's right the history yes and in america nowhere has there been a, a greater demographic dominance than uh the, the general white establishment the european powers coming in against black americans although you might include native americans as having experienced something maybe a little bit more brutal but this is also really important to the revision here uh you might also say mexicans uh or, or you know uh, people who were pushed uh, out south and west from the original uh, colonial expansion. And what you said, Hotep, on, on Rogan's show that really struck at the heart of untangling this was it's not economically realistic. You use an even stronger term. Do you remember what it was? Uh, no, I don't. I, you I, said I, it's not, economically viable. It doesn't make... It, I don't, said, like, it doesn't make economic sense. Like, why <laughs> would... And, and so what you're getting at is given the general history that we know of that of, of the last you know thousand years or, or so and, and all these dynamics that we talk about in, in terms of the settling of the new world, the general mythology is that European settlers came here, uh, pushed a few Native Americans out of the way, and brought black people as slaves from Africa. And it's tempting in the narrative of this to say, well, yeah, white people here were, were, the, were the jerks. You know, were the, they were the bad guys in this. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, as you know, I, I don't have to point out to you, but to the audience, for the audience's benefit, I'm not trying to pretend that, that all whites were responsible for slavery. And it's also worth pointing out, as you did, that black people, Africans, were slave owners. And yeah. that this myth, this myth of black people being brought from Africa as slaves. And when you said this to Joe Rogan, he was like, wait, wait, you know, this isn't, this isn't fabricated out of whole cloth. We have the pictures. We have the diagrams of the boat. We've got the movies. The ho Hollywood tells us this is true, right? And you go, and, and I think it's important in the way you present this in, in any kind of revisionism history to say, no, they didn't fabricate it out of whole cloth. But I think the main point of your revision here is that this narrative paints black Africans as weak, uncivilized, and 
ready to be enslaved. Yeah. Or to sell each other off, as is sometimes included in the narrative, that it was powerful Africans who sold off weak Africans to the European slave traders. And that probably happened. And, 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 and you incorporated this. And you said it's, it's a small part, but it's nowhere near explaining how America's black population got here today. Yeah. So the importance of this is not just in the narrative being accurate, but the assumptions that we go about with. And there's one really prickly one I'm going to challenge you on with at the end here. But Hotep, is that is that a fair summary? And and if, if that's a fair yeah. summary, what are the implications for the black paradigm today? So, I mean, we first have to understand what slavery meant in Africa and what it meant in America. Um, you know, in, in Africa, when you had slavery, it wasn't like bondage, right? Um, in fact, you had a lot of freedom um, as a slave. It was a more humane form of tribalist servitude rather than yeah. I mean, you could, slavery. I mean, they, they threw a party when it was when you could buy your freedom or when when you asked for your freedom. You could ask for your freedom, like you could say, "Yo, I want to be free." And they threw a party and said, "Wow, you want to be free? Like, great, that's awesome." And they sometimes they would invest in you to get a new house. Right. So and, and that's not from black sources. That's from white sources. If you go read the outline of history, they, you know, a white source admits it. And I don't think that book is completely accurate on everything. But there's several sources that explain what slavery looked like in Africa. And it wasn't this thing where, you know, they beat people and all the time. And even if you go read Thaddeus Russell's book, um, Renegade History, you know, the brutality of slavery isn't as what they say. And he's got some of the empirical data to, to, to back that up. So when people talk about slavery, it's like there's lots of now, nuances hold on. Let me, to let me, this. Let me, sorry. So there's there's an image that comes to my, you know, upper middle class, white, educated brain from the textbooks. When you say all that, like the pictures of uh, slaves being whipped. Um, yeah. Are, so, are, so are, when you talk about when you talk about whipping, like you know, in Thaddeus Russell's book, white people was whipped too. You know, white people would be strapped to pillories. You so know, it's just like, a more, yeah, it's just, oh, uh, this goes to the more accurate historical narrative that it was just a more brutal culture overall. Yeah. But, I mean, lynching lynchings were a thing. I mean, you're not trying to say that like racism isn't a problem or that the oppression of of Black America, but you're making an important historical point that Black explorers got to the new world without the help of Europeans at some point. Yeah, I mean, the rulers of the rulers of Songhai Empire and Mali were traveling back and forth to the Americas before 1492, you know? Um, uh, I think his name was Abu Kari. I forget the name of the ruler, but Abu Kari had sent an expedition to come to the Americas long before. Um, but the thing is, you don't even have to look at Africa. You can just look at the Caribbean, you know, Cristobal Colon or Bartolomeu de las Casas and their own writings talk about how, you know, when they visited the Caribbean and South America and they were looking for gold, um, they met black people. So it's like you have these islands, which are not far from the Americas at all. I mean, I believe Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. You know, so it's like to say that these people couldn't have gotten to the Americas via Central um, Latin America, Central America or, you know, uh, the ocean from Cuba. I mean, you see people getting from Cuba to America today. Right? You got people leaving Haiti today. Coming yeah, to the right. Americas you can do that <laughs> on, a, on a like, you, you know, a, raft. a makeshift raft. Right. They're yeah. making it to America. So, you know, when you when you look at that, it's like it's not impossible to say that you know, black people didn't make it to the Americas. But when I was a child and, you know, people showed me these images of Native Americans, I always saw a mulatto, right? They were light skinned, they weren't black and they weren't white. And I'm like, the only person I know that's not black and not white is a mulatto. And so I never believed that the natives were what they said they were. I always was like, who are these people? All right. Like yeah. who, I didn't know what they were. I didn't know if they were black or if they were white or if they were separate. But I'm like, mm, who are these people? Because I ain't yeah, never seen them in real life before, right? So then yeah, I'm, I'm, on, a... I'm on Sorry. tour, right? I'm on tour in 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 Miami, right? And uh, we just did a major show um, for a car show, and um, some guys approach us at a bar, um, and come to find out they're quote unquote Native American. And uh, the guy owns a casino. So 
the guy that owns the casino is a white man. Like he looked like blonde hair, blue eyes, white man. And he's like, yep. I'm a Native American. And I'm just yep. like, uh, okay, sure, buddy. But the people that worked for him looked more like uh, a Mexican, right? A darker <laughs> skinned Mexican. So I'm like, ah. Oh. So then when you when you when you when you are a hotep, uh, hoteps are researchers and historians by necessity. We know about the dolls roll, and a lot of people don't know about the dolls roll. But the dolls roll is basically what they call a the five dollar Indian, and basically for five dollars you could buy your own Native Americanism. You could become oh, a Native right. American yeah. paying to get on this list, and they considered you a Native American. So why? You know, I, uh, I have my own version of this today, by the way. I, I'm a member of the Oklahoma. I don't claim genetics but I, I am a member of the Oklavoya Native American Church which basically gives me the ability to opt out of the drug war with uh, with this argument I beat four felonies and a misdemeanor drug charges in Texas so it is a nice little legal loophole yeah. you know but yeah people, you're talking about people manipulating the system your yeah. bigger point I think was it was that it, in in sort of prehistory or just even before modern history there was way more global travel and intermixing of different groups and we oversimplify it into the narrative that we walk around with today. Yeah, yeah. As if to say there were no boats. I mean, you go look at ancient Babylon, ancient Canaan, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt. They had boats. <laughs> yeah. Everybody had boats. Yeah. It's not like some crazy technology that is new, right? So it's like, yeah. it's to say as if black people are the only ones that have boats. In fact, surfing was discovered in Africa. You know, white men saw black people surfing in Africa and, they, and then it became a sport. Right. So it's to say that, you know, black people are afraid you're not of giving water. Hawaiian, hold on. You're denying Native Hawaiians credit for that. Well, Native Hawaiians are black. OK. All right. All right. At, All right. I, see, at, I see where you're going go, with that. Go, then. All go right, look at, if you go look at I think it was in 1812 was the last kingdom. Don't, 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 uh, quote oh, you know, this, the, the story, oh, the king. story of, yeah, the story of the eradication of the last Hawaiian kingdom yeah. is, 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 is one of the most underreported, undertaught stories of American history. And when they teach yeah. there, it's still a whitewashed version of American history that yeah. admits to trail of tears and the crimes against the Apaches and, and the, you know, smallpox, smallpox blankets. Oh yeah. We went to paradise and, and basically killed most of the natives who were making it paradise. Like, yeah, that's that ha that yeah. was part of American history too. Yeah, all you got to do is look up King Kamehameha, and yeah. if you go look at him and you go look at the drawings of this man, I mean, it looks like Ben Carson, right? <laughs> Wait, hold on, it's not Kamehameha. It's way more fun to say that way. Kamehameha. Uh, I, yeah, Kamehameha. That's why I'll have you on say it, but I'm, we're talking about a native <laughs> black population with nappy curly hair, so. We were in Hawaii. This is a Hawaiian kingdom. We were all over. It's the, the newest race to earth is the white race. So we've been everywhere. Y'all are discovering us. You didn't discover the land. You're discovering us. Said so everywhere that, you know, all they go look at all the explorers. If you go look at all their data, they said no matter where they go, they run into Africans. No matter so where I, they go. For, for again, for my audience, I want to contextualize this a little bit. Uh, and, and, and really tie it to what I consider a very important intellectual process of being uh, of objective reasoning, of, of, of using the scientific method uh, of, of even just like of journalism, you know, uh, of just, you know, studying history with integrity. Yeah. Right. And I, I I'm going to stop myself before I say anything more on this particular subject. But what's the biggest myth enforcing the biggest racket in the world today other than government itself? That black people in America were oppressed. No, no. Well, the biggest racket is the military, right? Other than government itself. No, nah, I don't think so. military. Oh, Hold on, hold on. You see where I'm going with this. Um, but uh, World War II. The myth of World War II was written by the victors. Yeah. I'm not even going to use the H word here because you're going to set up. This is going to trigger all the alarm. I'm not a denier. Right. But I do think World War II history needs to be severely revisited in order to destroy the underlying myth of militarism, 
which was that it was a military that saved the world from Nazism and that we need to have it to keep us safe and that we should accept a military that outspends the rest of the world several times over is the biggest military in the world, the biggest source of evil in the world today. Uh, so when we talk about, I, I, I want you to then, with, with that in mind, connect this narrative, which, you know, for people, like, and Joe Rogan asked you, oh, did you just come up with this? Or is this like, no, and you, you said you studied this 15 years prior, you know, and it's just something that you incorporate into your self-awareness. Do the research, get the answers, get a more accurate worldview, be ready to challenge other people's false assumptions about people. And you, in that sense, knowledge is power. That's a unique kind of power that you get from having a more accurate view of the world and of history. So, yeah. how do you connect this to what we're experiencing right now, the current black paradigm? Uh, do you believe the surge in Black Lives Matter activism is just controlled opposition to distract from coronavirus and all the rich getting richer and poor getting poorer scams around that? It's election season. You know, during election season, you gotta understand. I, I believe that less than half the population actually votes in this election, right? Oh yeah. So that means that half the people in America, are like this, they don't believe in this bullshit ass government. Um, in fact, when you, you know, I like that you brought up war, right? Because when we talk about um, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, the United States had to do a draft conscription, right? Right. They had to force men to join the military. When you have people who believe in your country, you don't have to force the men to fight. They'll volunteer, right? <laughs> so it goes yep. to show you that Americans never really believed in this government. So if you're one of those Americans who believe in this government, oh, man, you're blue pill like a motherfucker. You know, <laughs> you, there's something wrong with you. You're, you, you're McGraw-Hill educated. You've been brainwashed. You're a product yep. of liberal education. You're you're stupid, um, if you ask me. Um but yeah, you know, um, when the government has to force their men into war, it kind of tells you everything to be said that people didn't agree with these wars. And even we saw Vietnam, you know, there's massive protests with Vietnam. Um, and then, you know, you look at some of the more privileged people that were able to buy their way out of conscription and not be drafted into the army, you know, in all the, you know, previous wars. But these wars are wholly, um, you know, so World War One was definitely created to create a recession. Um, the Revolutionary War was created to create a uh, the Civil War was created to create a recession. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Revolutionary War was also created to create a recession because going to war costs money, <laughs> it costs resources, right? Right. So it, it, I, and I, also, I would hold on. I would I would disagree slightly in your characterization. I think you're under including the role or under describing the role of central central banks in all these wars. Well, that's exactly the point of causing the the recession to have an excuse for a central bank, right? Sure. Because Fair I know, they're definitely related, yeah. Yeah, you know, they want to cause a recession for the purpose of installing a central bank and that's why, you know, people like Andrew Jackson fought against it um and so on and so forth, you know, but um even even when we look at the Civil War uh, and the agreement between the North and the South, uh, the North said, look, we'll bring you in, but we're not taking your debt that you owe to the bankers. We're not accepting that debt. And that was part of the agreement. So it, it goes to show you that a lot of this was about creating debt. Also, you have to understand is with war, war halts technology. Um, when you're at war, you cannot um, create technology, you know, you're, you're busy fighting, so you can't evolve as a species. And that's been a, a huge problem for all warring nations. That's why you see places like Libya going backwards in evolution, right? And they've been bombed back, right. to the, you know, 1910s. <laughs> as far bombed, as back, bombed back to the prohibition era, right? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'm uh, sorry, man, there's so, you so have many about black lives topics. Matter. What's that? You asked me about Black Lives Matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my fundamental question. I think my, my critical question on this, is it fair to say that right now the American black community is being used as a pawn in the bigger political manipulation for the election and to distract from the coronavirus financial manipulation? Um, I'm not too sure about the coronavirus aspect, but absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, black people. Well, hold on, just to be clear, my, my point on that was when it when they first declared the state of emergency, there was a two point three trillion dollar spending bill, and then it went up by a trillion, and then there was another three trillion, and then there was another three. It was nine trillion dollars. America. Here's my point, Hotep, and, and you know what? If if you don't put as much stake in this as I do, I respectfully respect your analysis. But uh, we, all of America, is is talking about Black Lives Matter, police brutality issues. Whereas if that wasn't happening right now, we'd be going like, uh, where did that nine trillion dollars go? You know, I, I, it's well, just like well, the Pentagon well, and nine eleven. Well, here's why I disagree with that. When Trump issued twelve hundred dollars to every single American in America, they made it, made us complicit in the crime, and that is what shut everybody up. The fact that we got that twelve hundred, people stop yeah, asking. That's part of it. You know, so I, I do think that Black Lives Matter and this whole thing um, was partly a distraction from COVID. I do I do think it played some role, but I really feel like. This is just the script that happens every four years. So it's more it's more about Democrats just doing their thing. Yeah, it's like, you know, okay. it's, like, it's, like, it's like it's like it's like first comes SARS, then comes black people, then comes the mass shooting, then comes the hurricane, then comes the Yeah, right. Yeah. Run to the vote. No, I, like, it's I, the same I, thing every year. So that's why I'm like, it's I don't know if it's a distraction or is it just part of the script. Yeah. So I you know, I would mm, Yeah. Uh I I would just I would I would I couldn't say that I'm complicit in the crime because uh, did this you is money. That, yeah, I did, and and it, this is and, and I my general crime. No, no, you can say accepting stolen goods, but it's money that's been stolen from me, and it's money that was borrowed in my name. The federal government borrowed six thousand dollars in my name that they're going to try to get me to pay for later, one way or another, and they gave me twelve hundred dollars of it. That's a bad deal. I'm not complicit. Like no, I'm I'm accepting injury here. I'm not better off because this this program happened, and I had nothing to do with making it happen. Or so, so anyway, we can argue ethics in another interview. In fact, wait, I should have you on again, and uh, we'll we'll because I heard you you gave uh, uh, both myself and our mutual friend uh, from whom I know you, uh, Chad is my name, Chad Lemoyne in uh, yeah, Chad Chad. yeah. Um, so you know, talk about libertarians with with perspectives that you respect, and that was uh, a very much appreciated shout out. So. Yeah. A um, couple questions. I told you we get to one really hard one. This isn't it, but your your racial identity yourself. Yeah. You know, uh, you you said you you saw mulattoes. You know, and I, maybe this is my own ignorance of you know African ethnic diversity. Um, I I know that if, I've seen pictures of people who are so black that they're practically blue. They you know the, the there's some Africans who are so black. dark they got a, what's that? It's called blue black. Yeah, they got that blue sheet. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, but you're you're not that black. How so? How do you identify? Do you have do you have any white in you or any other ethnic breakdowns? And, and do you differentiate for yourself your own ethnic breakdown? And does that relate to any of uh, what we're talking about, or is it just totally irrelevant to you? In Africa, I'd be considered light skinned Right. So I definitely am not one hundred percent African blue black blood. Right. There's definitely. You know, for example, um, my great my great grandfather is a white man from Germany mm. on my father's side. So I got white blood. You okay. know, my, my my grandmother is technically a mulatto. Mm. And that's where yes, I, <laughs> I think I think that was Mr. Folks. I forget his last name. I want to say that's Mr. Folks. But yeah, you know, um, I have a white man as my, my great grandfather's a white man. <laughs> There's been miscegenation all throughout American history. You know, when you have people that live together, they they fornicate together. Um, you know, you you see that. That's why I, I love Thad Thaddeus Russell's book. I'm working through it now. He told me, he was like, you know, this book's gonna challenge you. And I'm like, this shit ain't challenging me. This shit is confirming and shit I've been believing in my head, just didn't have the proof for years. But um, you know, whites and blacks have been mixing for years. Uh, I know that my blood isn't a hundred percent you know, blue, black, African, but I still identify as an African. Well, I'm by ethnicity, half Jewish and half German, basically. So, okay. I don't know whether to, uh, yeah, I don't know which half of me to hate more. Uh, <laughs> right. And it, you know, I think if, uh, if, if my Jewish mom and my German ancestry dad can, uh, can get together and make babies, 
There's no reason we can't all get along and right. just keep screwing each other till we all come out the same color. You know, the Bullworth strategy, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. No. So one last serious question. And, and if you don't mind, uh, we're going to take a few questions from the chat. Jim, you got a few queued up, I assume, at this point. And this is this is my la this is the really hard one. Okay. And you know, I I know that I'm I'm doing this with no you know bad intent, but there are uh, thorny issues raised around race realism. I like I like to think of myself as a Carlos Mencia race realist. Like, yeah, there are differences between races. Let's talk about it. Let's laugh about it, and do it out of love and embracing differences. You know, we yeah. don't have to. Be, you can you can be racially charged and address racial issues without being demeaning or hateful in any way yes and a lot of the race the, the the mainstream race realists today you know i i hesitate to use that term for myself because uh it, it has so many negative connotations with people who use race realism as their cover for racism that being said a lot of them will say that there are differences in iqs between the races and this is another dangerous part. Like this really ties into the myth of black Africans were a helpless primitive society and smart white Europeans on big boats went and rounded them up and brought them over to build the American civilization, right? Mm. And, mm. and if, if you believe that narrative, then it's really easy to go, okay, well, yeah, black people are dumber than, uh, what, what is it? The, 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 the typical breakdown that they use in the United States, they'll say, oh, well, Jews are the smartest, then Asians, then white Europeans, then Hispanics, then black people. Uh -huh. and, and, and every time you hear that repeated, you go, what kind of what kind of asshole is just like, re like, really? Like the way it's brought up, you know, most of the time is to justify racism. Right. Yeah. And. My, my question to you, aside from, you know, what do you make of all of that is, is it possible that, you know, on the whole, uh, you know, j intelligence across ethnicities is, is really more or less the same and that it's a product, like, if, if you accept the scientific evidence that black Americans have a lower IQ than white Americans, I mean, right away I go, well, you say they're more criminal, well, because they get treated worse by cops. And by the yeah. system, they get charged more. You know, we yeah. see this on the streets, like just that you get treated differently. Like, of course. So, you you know, all of the, the legacy of slavery is going to impact your IQ, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is it possible well, that... The funny or, thing is... And, and there's test biases. And, all right, I've opened up enough worms here. So please go ahead. The funny thing is when you mention that hierarchy from Jewish on down to black, that's also the same hierarchy for income earning. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, IQ is based upon um, your income. If you're if you are uh, from raised an in a rich household with all the benefits and advantages. Yeah. I mean, for example, um, a large part of the IQ test is math. Right. Uh, a large part of the IQ test is uh, geography um, and being able to unscramble words. I've taken an IQ test to see what my IQ is at. And, um, you know, I find that if you. If you studied math up to probably, you know, trigonometry, you'll probably score really high on the IQ section, on the on the math section of the IQ test. It's now, inherently you, biased by educational experience. Yeah, it's exactly. You know, the only part in there that I think is even remotely fair is probably pattern recognition. But even that is based upon, you know, how much of society you're exposed to, right? How much it's still be something you're trained, right? If you live in a traumatic household and you're not stimulated, you're in a state of fear or anxiety or fight or flight, your brain's yeah. not going to develop and have the time to practice even pattern recognition, which is, uh, as you point out, a more legitimate metric of raw mental horsepower, right? Yeah, IQ has a lot to do with where you stand uh, as far as income is concerned, you know. So, you know, you take a Bushman from, you know, uh, South America, he's not probably not going to score too high in an IQ test, but he might right. be smarter than somebody that scored high, higher in IQ test. I mean, I've been around people who are, um, for example, when I worked with um, um, uh, 50 Cent, all of my colleagues were Ivy League graduates. We took a Harvard and Princeton and Yale, right? Brown University. And this is where I gained a lot of my confidence 
because these are some of the dumbest people I ever met. I mean, problems would come down and they'd panic. And then they'd come to me, the kid with no formal education, right? And he said, Brian, we need help. The funny thing is what they would do is they'd wait for the bosses to leave the office and then everybody would rush to my desk, right? Brian, can you help me with my project? I have a deadline tomorrow. And I'd be like, all right, do this, 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 and this. And then the next one would come, do this, this, and this. Next one would come, do this, this, and this. And the next day, everybody would take credit for the work, right? And they never gave me credit. And they they even at one point rallied against me and like formed a coalition against me because I was so dangerous inside the place, right? So I'm just like, you know, um, you know, I, I you know, I think it's because I didn't have the formal education is why I'm so smart because, and plus my dad challenged me a lot. You know, my dad always, you know, I was trained in chess from a young age and he just, he just used to give me like, you know, real world problems. How would you solve this? You know, how would you solve this? How would you solve this? He was always challenging me. So that's why my brain formed the way it did because my dad was just always challenging me. And I just feel like, you know, if you're not exposed to challenges, how do you grow? How does your brain grow if you're not exposed to consistent challenges and 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 word and mind puzzles? He gave me a lot of like mind puzzles, right? Right. So for example, if you hang around my dad, he'll ask you, uh, what's one um uh what's half of two plus two? Tell me. Two. Wrong. Two okay. and a half of a plus. Wrong. <laughs> half of two plus two is three. Because half of two is one plus two is three. Okay. Depending <laughs> on where you put the parentheses in the <laughs> equation. Gotcha. Yeah. So like okay. my, dad, my dad would, you know, he'd always have these types of things in the household. And my brother being yep. as genius he that, is, I was just exposed to it. You know, my dad did the same thing with me and my little brother. When It was when we were driving to school. You would, And it was like stock market stuff and you know, random math logic questions. I think that's, that's a huge, I, that's so funny that we have that in common. Do you know AI. about the, uh, the, the, the fox, uh, the thief and the, and the, and the, and the hen and the egg, I think it is. Do you know that one? No, no, no yeah. riddles. No, hold on, hold on. We only got a few minutes left. I want to go to the odds, but I, I, that right. also reminds me you're a chess player. You're going to have to come visit us sometime here in the mountains in Arizona at the Garden of Freedom. We'll get a chess game on here Let's on the, the, the rooftop lanai. So if you have a couple minutes, let's let's can we do a, la a lightning round of uh, questions from or comments from the audience. Uh, we have comment Jim Freedom in studio is just going to be speaking from off camera. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, okay. Well, C.J. Abernathy. All <laughs> right. Our first our producer. actual question. Yeah, we got some comments. Producer today. privilege. It's, it's All right. An actual question. Right. You want me to read it, please? please? Hotep, what do you believe is the best strategy to educate and inform people that you call blue pill? to the two-party duopoly mentality? Uh, kidnap them, strap them to a seat, and make them um, watch your the documentaries that red-pilled you for a week straight. You know, if you can't, if you, you know, <laughs> it's, it, you have to do the same thing that made them that way, right? The same thing that made them that way was somebody strapped them to their sofa and they sat there and they watched hours of TV all day and made them to believe what they believed, or they strapped them to some school desk and made them believe what they believed. You would have to literally take this person you know, go to some retreat for a month and just overload them with so information that by the time they came out, you know, for example, I had a friend that came over and he was arguing with me. He's like, yo, I had to unfollow you on Instagram because it was too much Trump stuff. Da, da, da. And I sat there and I played a clip of Malcolm X talking about liberals. He's like, I've never seen that before. And it, <laughs> like he wasn't uh, he didn't turn into a Trump fan, but 15 minutes had him rethink everything he previously thought, right? Yeah. So it's, about, it's about presenting people with, with information. Yeah, and never, making, yeah. Sorry? And make just making people think. Yeah, and giving them the space to be ignorant, acknowledging that they might be wrong. Everybody does this. Everybody overstates their knowledge and opinions mm -hmm. uh, as if they're way more informed than they are. So give people credit for that. And sometimes it's just, oh, I didn't know that. Hey, did you yeah. know this? And so if I, if I made a quick addendum to the answer, be loving, be persistent, and be very, very, very patient. And remember how long it took you to wake up and what a process that was. And for me, it was 10 years. So, Jim, what's next? Uh, Jeremy Gooding, he was talking about the IQ test. IQ tests show one's ability of taking IQ tests. Pretty much it. Fair yeah. enough. No, and, and my question was obviously not a, a perfectly yeah. researched frame. I mean, I could have I could have taken a whole page 
just to ask that question with all the caveats and well, not meaning this, meaning that, and if I could have included in that question, but yeah, I think uh, Hotep's point was very well taken there. Yeah. We can, always, we can always tell how great an interview is by how quiet the comment section is. People uh, are listening adamantly, I think. they. I loved everything you were talking about. I like what you said about the IQ test as well. He's a good we should have him back. Yeah, I, yeah think, I think there is some some use. I, I, here's what I call the IQ test. IQ test is how well you've uh, grown accustomed to Western culture. Sure. Western yeah, civilization. Yep. Yep. Same with SATs, uh, ACTs, all that stuff that, that we use as our not so magical sorting hat of deciding who's worthy of higher status in America today. Yeah. So, Mr. Jesus. Uh, we've only got a minute left here. I want to give you the last word. Anything on anything we've discussed today you want to include? We got your website up there. Or sorry, your Twitter feed and uh, your Twitter handle. I always, oh no, you are at Hotep Jesus now. You had a different handle before. You got it switched. That's awesome. Get your following switched over. So it is at H O T E P Jesus. I think you know how to spell Jesus uh, on Twitter. Any any other last words, sir? Now just hit that link, uh, brianshop.co, connect with me, get on my email list. And um, that's where I communicate with everybody. And that's where I communicate my main message. So I think just get on my email list. That's the most important thing you could do. All right. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time today, sir.